muted. We stay on track. Um, as I mentioned, I am Lisa Bassani. I'm the project director for Working Lands Alliance, uh, which is a project uh, of American Farmland Trust uh, here in Connecticut. Um, we are uh, two of the co-sponsors of the webinar, uh, American Farmland Trust, Working Lands Alliance, uh, but also the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, and for those of you that are AICP planners, uh, you know that we uh, you will receive 1.5 certification maintenance credit for attending. Um, I just want to thank Susan Westa from CCAPA um, and Phil Chester from the town of Lebanon for uh, their help in arranging for those credits to be uh, to be provided. So for those of you um, who are unfamiliar with American Farmland Trust, uh, we are a national nonprofit. Uh, dedicated to uh, protecting farmland, promoting sound farm practices, and keeping farmers on the land. Um, here in Connecticut, uh, uh, we have the Working Lands Alliance, which is a project at AF AFT. Uh, we are a statewide coalition dedicated to uh, preserving Connecticut farmland uh, and advancing the economic viability uh, of our farms. We have been around since 1999. Uh, much of our work is really focused on um, ensuring that the state is making robust investments in its farmland protection program, uh, but also in the variety of programs that, uh, that support our farmers. And those are our two websites, so uh, feel free to, uh, to go there and check it out after the webinar. Sorry. Um, so in, in Connecticut, uh, one of our real successes over the last uh, eight or so years is our Planning for Agriculture Guide. Uh, this is a comprehensive guide for Connecticut municipalities. Um, and it's really aimed at uh, providing tools and resources for towns to create an ag-friendly environment uh, where our farm businesses can thrive. Uh, we initially created this in 2008, um, did some extensive outreach on it. Um, we're just uh, about to revise it again. It's uh, actually currently at the printer as we speak. And uh, you will all receive uh, and updated uh, uh, the updated copy of this newest edition uh, as soon as it is back from the printer. Um, but again, this is a lot of what this webinar is based on are the tools here, um, but the guide really uh, goes into extensive detail on, on many of these topics. So do hope that you will um, use this as a resource going forward, refer to it. Um, there's there's a really a, a great amount of information in this guide. So for this webinar, we have a few um, goals and objectives, um, uh, one of which is, uh, hang on, one I apologize, that was uh, another phone, so apologize. But the, the goals and objectives for this webinar are really um, to provide planners, municipal staff, commission members, um, and, and many others, uh, including all of you on the webinar, A, an understanding of the agricultural context here in Connecticut. Uh, what are the trends? What are our farmers facing? Uh, what is going on in, in terms of agriculture here in Connecticut? Um, B, tools to foster a supportive community environment uh, for our farmers and our farm businesses, and really providing some, some planner takeaway tools for all of you. Uh, See ways to engage farmers in the planning process. And finally, uh, some information on programs, tools, and resources available to all of you to support agriculture um, in all of your communities. So I did send out the webinar outline to all of you. Um, hopefully, you received that. Uh, we will start off uh, with uh, my colleague, Kip Kolstinskis, who will uh, provide us uh, we'll get us started on the status of, and trends of agriculture in Connecticut. Um, I'm sure many of you know Kip uh, very well. He has extensive experience in agriculture in the state. Uh, we'll follow that with uh, two planners, Phil Chester and Steve Kleppen, talking about uh, fostering a supportive community environment for agriculture. Uh, after that, our farmland, our farmland preservation director at the Connecticut Department of Agriculture will talk about farmland protection at the local level. Uh, after that, uh, Joe Nichols, uh, my great colleague at Connecticut Farm Bureau Association, will talk about engaging farmers in the ag community in the planning process. Uh, and we will end uh, with Kip again talking about tools and assistance to bolster agriculture in our communities. 
Um, at the end, we hopefully have about five, uh, 15 minutes for question and answers. Uh, so uh, as I have here on our webinar logistics, um, you can ask questions at any time. You will see a drop-down button, a drop-down menu where you can type in a question. Uh, we will receive those. Uh, by and large, we intend to take those questions at the end. Uh, if there's uh, something that we want to address uh, while a presenter is speaking, we will do so. But uh, for the most part, we will do those at the end. And finally, if you have any technical difficulties, um, there's two options. You can either uh, send a message to technical support through the chat function, and uh, that will be staffed by my colleague Greg Plotkin at American Farmland Trust. Um, and if for some reason that's not working, you can email Greg at gplotkin at farmland.org. So with that, um, I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Kip Paul Stenskis. Uh, he is currently a consulting conservation scientist uh, working for such uh, uh, clients as American Farmland Trust, Connecticut Department of Agriculture, Yukon Extension, and many others. Um, he is a member of the Working Lands Alliance Steering Committee um, and also the Connecticut Council on Environmental Quality. Um, but probably many of you know Kip for his former role um, as a longtime soil scientist for USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, for both Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, Kip has extensive experience on um, working with farmers, educators, governments, and nonprofits uh, to help them protect farmland and wetlands uh, and use those, that soil's information to make better informed land use decisions. Uh, so I want to uh, welcome Kip and hand over the reins to him. Kip. Okay. Thank you very much, Lisa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to talk again a little bit about background on agriculture in Connecticut, where it's headed, some of the trends, what to be aware of, and some of the challenges at the local level. So let's get started here. So what is agriculture in Connecticut? Again, we have all have our own ideas and prejudices, and I'm not going to read the general statutes, and though I would certainly encourage all of you to do that. And I think Joan's going to discuss kind of the consequences of using those or not using those. So uh, look forward to that. Bottom line, agriculture is very diverse, more than you can possibly imagine, and it's changing. So let's, for today, let's use a big umbrella of what we consider to be agriculture. So um, a little bit of a history box. I always like to start out with a historical perspective. So Connecticut agriculture has, has always been diversified and innovative. So whether it's Native Americans bringing corn, bean, and squash here over a thousand years ago to somebody having the crazy idea to put a tent over a tobacco field to make a better crop. Down in the lower left-hand corner you have the Weathersfield uh, onion girls and to me that's an early, early example of branding of a product. People still know and recognize the red onion of Weathersfield today. So great job on that branding Weathersfield. And then on the bottom right, this is uh, a boy with sheep, a, a, a famous photograph. But what's noteworthy is, of course, we had all the woolen mills in New England and Connecticut. And Connecticut farmers ended up being the largest producer of sheep in the 1800s to try to meet the demands of those mills. So the still revolutionary, I actually like that tagline. And I particularly like that tagline as it relates to agriculture. So. Farmers are continuing to ad uh, ad adapt societal demands, outside side forces like climate change. So you have the Freunds there in the upper left with converting cow manure into planting pots instead of EPA. Community supported agriculture shares in the lower left. We have farm stands, so people selling directly to consumers. And we were kind of ahead of the curve on that. So agriculture isn't just a placeholder to residential or commercial or industrial. It's a valuable land use that's tied to a business. And though there are inputs and outputs from those businesses that we need to remember. And agriculture provides so much for so little. And I would particularly note on this list here the climate change mitigation and adaptation. This is a land use that does that, that a lot of other land uses do not. Stores carbon, recharges groundwater, helps with extreme precipitation. 
So where is our agricultural land? So this is percentage of, of land cover. Uh, we have agriculture in all 169 towns, even in our cities, if you use this broader definition of agriculture. And it's uh, viable all over the state. And though we do need to take, have special, take special care of where we have clusters of agriculture, because that serves as a nucleus for agriculture every place. So you look at some of these, the dark spots there with the concentrations, Lebanon Franklin, Woodstock Pomfret, Litchfield Hills, Canaan Valley, Upper Connecticut Valley. And there are smaller clusters of agriculture that are significant, like the White Hills of Shelton. So how much do we have? Kind of what I want you to get from this slide is that uh, a farm is not usually just a field. It's forests. It's buildings. It's even land underwater. We have aquaculture in Long Island Sound. So but basically, a little over 12% of our land cover is devoted to agriculture in the state. Top crops, people are always ask, and uh, again, that's continuing to evolve and diversify. The thing I think it's noteworthy about this slide is you look at the forage of the corn for silage of how much acreage is devoted to the dairy industry and support for the dairy industry. So, and that's one of our challenges, that dairy is struggling. It's really the only commodity crop that we have, so they're not really in control of the price. And so we need to help them be successful, and if they can't, to transition that land and those businesses to other forms of agriculture. So the last ag census, we had a lot of really good data, 2012. And we actually have an increase in farms in Connecticut. And though you'll note that a lot of those are 50 acres or less of small farms increase. And those small farms are doing a lot of direct sales. And though if you look at the economic productivity, it's really the larger farms that are producing most of the value. Something like 4% of our large farms produce 80% of the dollar value in the state. So we need to make sure we take care of the large farms as well. Again, thinking about some of the issues that are impacting agriculture, American Farmland Trust did some more detailed analysis of, of farmers and what they're going to be doing with their land and their businesses. So on the left here, we have an aging farm population with not a lot of operators under 45 that are working directly with them. That's, that's a concern of transitioning those, that land and those businesses. And the beginning farmers that we do have on the right uh, unlike a lot of states, a lot of our beginning farmers are actually over 45. So, of course, maybe 45 is the new 20. But anyway, that, that's something to, to, be, to be aware of and concerned about. Um, as we look at the next slide, Farm Seekers and the Interest, Connecticut has a farm link program. So that's like a matchmaking service for people that want to farm and people that have land. So a little analysis is done there on the left of kind of what these people that want to farm and we have over 200 people in that database come all over the country that want to farm in Connecticut. And this is what they're interested in doing for kinds of agriculture. On the right, there's a little bit of a disconnect between those older farm operators, that red line, and the kinds of farms they have, and the people that are principal operators or under 45 of the kind of farms that they have. So are these new farm seekers able to meet some of those needs for certain kinds of agriculture and take over the rain. So that's something we'll have to help with the transition on. So let's look at the big picture here. We know we're on the East Coast, the megalopolis of the Northeast, between Boston and New York, and the heart of the marketplace, and sprawls on the move. So you know we lost a lot of farmland and farms in the past between 85 and 2010. We lost over 14 percent of our agricultural land, uh, open fields, in Connecticut, and uh, not a list that you'd want to be top of, Hartford County lost 29%. So we know sprawls back on the move. So we're going to talk about farmland protection and keeping farms viable is one of the best ways to keep, keep agriculture uh, moving forward. And we know it did slow during the recession, but it's back on the rise. So let's take another thing I like to do, take a big picture perspective and work our way back down. So decade of change, we know that things going on in the world global demand, how are we going to feed American people? We know we need to eat differently. We need to eat more fruits and vegetables. It makes a lot of sense to grow them closer to where people live. The Northeast has 27% of the population on 7% of the land. Um, we know people are concerned about where their food comes from, the quality, the integrity. 
Uh, from a climate change perspective, again, the Northeast, we're going to have adequate water, may not always be here when we need it, and a climate that's reasonable for agriculture and for people. So the demographers are actually talking about more people moving back to the Northeast. Uh, Southwest, not going to have any water. So it's really a national security issue. The, the, the world issues of security are going to revolve around food and water. So fortunately, we're going to have some both of those things. So and then the kind of the big dog to think about is that actually, you know, at the bottom of the state there, we're in the food shed of New York City. There's over 14 million people. And again, as I said, it's over 30 million customers within two hours of Connecticut for all of our all of our goods and services. So there's the future is bright for agriculture if we can help capitalize the opportunity and the farmers can make a decent living and have the support system that they need to grow their businesses. A lot of innovation going on around there using science and technology, hydroponics, aquaculture, permaculture, uh, trying to capture the marketplace, emphasizing Connecticut grown project products. We have farm to school, farm to chef programs, increase in farmers markets, farm stands, getting stuff in grocery stores, added value products, community gardens, using it to meet some of our social obligations some really great great success stories going on out there. And I think a really exciting trend is of the direct marketing, of, of getting that dollar directly from the customer, which is really important because the cost of doing business, as we all know, is high in Connecticut. Down in the lower left-hand corner, that's one of the cheese caves at Cato Corner, my favorite cheese in the state. That's a great added value product that helps make agriculture viable. And then another thing you may not necessarily think of, but obviously probably requires a, a, some really good thinking for you as planners is, is agriculture as a destination in agro and ecotourism. People want to have that farm experience. And actually, from a pick your own operation, it saves the farmer because the customers are actually harvesting the crop. So what do these trends look like at the local level? You can have more diverse farms and farmers more climate can hold agriculture, that means greenhouses, that means hoop houses, more livestock, fruits and vegetables, more buildings and infrastructure on farms that are serving a variety of purposes over time. More customers at the farm, more on-farm processing, storage and sale, more intensive agricultural use, agriculture as a destination experience, and agriculture as a partner in some of our sustainability goals. We want to get organic waste out of the waste stream, Farmers can help us with that. We all want to shorten the, uh, the food miles. I think that's a, a really important part of sustainability. And you're going to see more agriculture in urban suburban areas. So a few examples on this next slide here. Some uh, food hubs and processing that's going on at, at Click and Willimantic. Urban agriculture in the upper right. We have farmers that are using robots. They're using robots to move plants. They're having robots to, move, to milk cattle. On the far right, you see those uh, kind of metal containers. That's an that's a added value product from an added value product. So the farmer's cow farms, some of them have these cheese pods from the Mystic Cheese Company. So they're actually making a cheese product from the branded farmer's cow product on some of the farmer's cow farms. So what does this look like from the challenges at the local level for all of us and for you uh, on the front line? So again, that using that broad definition of agriculture, that's, that's really important. So the land access and affordability, we know the cost of land is expensive. And we have an affordable housing crisis. There are places where people can find land to farm, but they can't find any place to live that they can afford. Flexibility in rules and regulations, that's with talking with the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture and the head of Farm Bureau. That's one of the things that they mentioned specifically is flexibility to adapt and change as, as the marketplace changes and the ag agriculture changes. So lack of integrated support by town and government staff. Um, you as a planner may be supportive, but if uh, the sanitary and the public works and the assessor are not on board, that may not be a good climate for agriculture in town. Taxes, lack of knowledge about agriculture by the general population as well as town staff and elected officials the issues of farming on the edge, so whether that's nuisance complaints or driving farm equipment around the, down the road, the problems that creates, and then variability between towns. Certainly a lot of our large farms farm in many towns, 
but some of the smaller ones do as too. So where there isn't consistency, it uh, makes it difficult to do business. So I'm going to stop there and uh, let's look at how we can keep ag viable and growing. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Lisa. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kip. And certainly, if you have any questions, um, you can type those in now under the question button. Um, but we will move on to our next section, uh, fostering a supportive community atmosphere for agriculture. Um, we will start off with Phil Chester. Phil is the town planner in the town of Lebanon. Uh, he holds professional degrees in planning and, ac and architecture. Um, and for those of you that know Lebanon, you know they have done um, extraordinary work on both their agricultural preservation program, but also um, such items as mandatory cluster regulations, village district zoning, um, and many other initiatives to support uh, their main economic engine there in agriculture. Um, so I just want to uh, hand the reins over to Phil. Uh, we're so uh, delighted to have Phil here. So uh, Phil, when you're ready, you are up. Thank you, Lisa. First off, I want to thank the Working Lands Alliance and the Connecticut chapter for sponsoring this session. I'm going to discuss some approaches that should help us view agriculture through our planning and economic development lens. Agriculture has its roots at the local level, and there is much that we as planners can do to promote it. After all, as Kip pointed out, agriculture is not just a town-by-town -town issue. The allowance of agriculture in our communities has a direct impact on the states and the region's overall agricultural environment. So let me start out by saying that it's amazing how many young, bright, and educated people choose to go into agriculture. The majority of these folks do this knowing that the physical labor can be hard and the pay mediocre, but that the rewards of working the land, being one's own boss, and creating and marketing a product are fulfilling. Agriculture is a business. And agricultural planning should be considered part of an overall community building effort. It includes open space and conservation planning, economic and sustainable development, and should be part of a fiscally responsible smart growth plan. I want to briefly introduce you to the community I represent and its close relationship to farming. Lebanon has a population of 7,500 people and is geographically one of the largest towns in the state. Half of Lebanon is tax classified under Public Act 490, with almost half that amount classified as farm versus forest land. Lebanon has almost 200 farms, as, as determined by the USDA. It is unique in both Connecticut and New England in that it has over 5,000 acres of preserved farmland, which is land privately owned with a permanent conservation easement prohibiting future subdivision or non-agricultural development. Lebanon's preserved farmland represents 12% of all preserved farmland in the state, which means it has the most amount of preserved farmland in Connecticut and I suspect New England. Lebanon preserves farmland by identifying specific goals in its POCD, setting aside funding in its annual budget, charging staff and commissions with the responsibility for reaching these goals, and partnering with the USDA, State Department of Agriculture, and nonprofits such as Connecticut Farmland Trust to preserve working farms. Finally, Lebanon has a variety of large and small-scale agriculture. On the large side is Hillendale Farm with 2 million chickens, which is New England's largest egg farm, Pride's Corner Farm, which is the largest wholesale nursery in the state, the greatest amount of horses per capita, 2,500 dairy and beef cattle, and that includes uh, headquarters of the farmer's cow, and multiple goat and sheep dairies, llama farms, farm stands, and CSAs. And lastly, Lebanon runs a farmer's market, has a right to farm ordinance, Connecticut's newest winery, and includes farmers in its decision-making process. Now, I hope that sounded like an economic development sales pitch for agriculture, because that is what helps draw new farmers to Lebanon. Before we discuss some zoning techniques that support agriculture, I want to spread a word of caution. Municipalities do their best when they focus on non-regulatory approaches to preserving or promoting agriculture and should only consider regulations when deemed absolutely necessary. 
This is important because there are few regulations that help promote or grow agriculture. Agriculture is a unique land use, yet since the beginning of zoning, most master plans and zoning regulations have given little consideration to agriculture as a land use. For the most part, zoning is silent when it comes to agriculture, and in the past, many practitioners, including myself, considered farmland to be vacant land ready to be filled with one of the bona fide land uses in zoning. However, happily, over the past 20 years, because of organizations like the Working Lands Alliance, the Department of Agriculture, the Farm Bureau, and others, agriculture has found its way into our enabling legislation, into our plans, and into our psyche. Today, Connecticut's enabling legislation requires that zoning be made with reasonable consideration for its impact on agriculture as defined in the state statute. As Kip said, the state statute broadly defines agriculture, which means that planners and zoning commissioners need to consider the impact zoning has on all of agriculture. Now, how many of you have seen the phrase farm-friendly regulations? Well, for most farmers, that just doesn't ring true. And I believe Joan Nichols from the Farm Bureau will attest to this shortly. Regulations related to agriculture are often antithetical to a goal of preserving and promoting agriculture because they are restrictive in nature. Nevertheless, the following regulations are generally considered positive for agriculture. The first is to include agriculture in our zoning regulations purpose section because so few regulations contain it. The purpose section of our zoning is important. Language to promote and protect existing agricultural uses in prime and important farmland soils and the promotion of cluster development are good to include. With these in our regulations, if we remember and follow them, this should help promote agriculture. Also, when we consider regulation changes or discuss development proposals with applicants, these should be considered. Another is to define open space in our regulations so that it includes the word agriculture. Wording could include land permanently preserved through deed or conservation restriction left in its natural state or developed for agriculture or recreation use. In addition, agriculture should be identified as a principal or primary land use in our regulations. Agriculture often occurs in small spaces and does not always need multiple acres of land. Again, too often our regulations do not adequately address agriculture and prohibiting it or keeping it silent is obviously problematic to the farming community, not to mention us, planners. Now with that being said, there may be areas in town where agriculture may not be permitted. In Lebanon, for example, there are about 500 lake homes that sit on a quarter acre abutting water. Because of water concerns for water quality, the town prohibits agriculture in these areas. The next suggestion is to mandate agricultural buffers as part of our open space requirement to help limit nuisance complaints. Agricultural buffers like fences can help make good neighbors. When residential development is proposed adjacent to active farmland, a no-build easement zone should be considered as part of an open space requirement so that homes, pools or other buildings are set back greater than what is typically required. In Lebanon, this no-build zone is 100 feet. And lastly, for decades now, planners have promoted cluster development for a host of environmental, fiscal, and even social reasons. Cluster development can also be used to save farmland. In Lebanon, which has mostly two-acre zoning, cluster subdivisions are mandatory, with homes allowed on a quarter acre based on a two-acre yield plan. As we know, large lots eat up the environment, which includes farmland, and leads to sprawl. We should try to save our working fields for the farmers who want to work it. Uh, try to stay away from regulating how livestock is permitted on a property. A horse can live on an acre if the land is properly cared for. On the other hand, a property owner with 100 acres who pens their animals up against their neighbor's property can cause a nuisance. My experience is that it is not the number of animals kept on a property that causes neighbor concerns, but how they are cared for. In the same way that animal control officers try to stay away from farm animals, so should zoning. 
leave it up to our Department of Agriculture best management practices. They have a whole division of trained and experienced inspectors who deal with farm animals every day. The RCND prepared a manual a few years ago for municipalities with regard to livestock, and I believe a link is provided at the end of this webinar where you can find it on the RCND website. Lebanon follows these guidelines and chooses not to regulate farm animals, but require farm buildings that house animals to be at least 100 feet away from all property lines. This translates to the need for a minimum of two acres for a farm animal. Next is try not to mandate how animal byproducts are kept. Again, this should be left to our professionals at the Department of Agriculture. Try to carefully consider farming before adopting a blight ordinance. After all, farming isn't always pretty. Lastly, try not to limit our community's definition of agriculture. Agriculture is a business that sometimes requires large quantities of land and not just in one community. By limiting the definition of agriculture town by town, you may be stifling business, let alone this use in your region. As planners, we know that the most important planning document is our plan of conservation and development, or master plan. It should express our community goals and aspirations regarding existing and proposed land uses, including agriculture, and should be the basis for sound zoning. Connecticut General Statute Section 823 requires that plans of conservation and development consider the protection and preservation of agriculture. In most communities, representatives from our agriculture communities should be included when drafting these plans. Plans can be as specific or broad as a community wants. However, all plans should contain a section on agriculture that includes specific goals and object objectives. Not surprisingly, Lebanon has devoted a large portion of its plan to agriculture, and it includes statements that say all ordinances, regulations, and policies should consider the importance of agriculture, and that all municipal boards, commissions, and agencies shall read and follow the plan. After each election, I try to deliver a copy of the town plan to newly elected and appointed officials and, ident and identify their role relative to the plan's implementation. In addition to the POCD, there are other planning studies a municipality can undertake that will likely shed light on the benefits of agriculture and help coalesce su support for this land use. These studies can be done at the time of adopting your POCD or in between plan adoption and referenced in the plan. The good news is that the Department of Agriculture has provided funding opportunities for municipalities to conduct these studies, and Cam Weimer from the department will address some of these opportunities shortly. A cost of community service study compares the cost of municipal services relative to specific land uses in a community. It requires an analysis of a certain budget year and attributes the town expenditures to specific land uses such as residential, commercial, or industrial, and open space or farmland. These studies show that for every tax dollar collected from residential development, more than a dollar is expended in municipal services. After all, it's people that require the services, not the cows. In Lebanon, our studies showed that only 17 cents was expended for each dollar collected in taxes on farmland. So in other words, agriculture pays more than its fair share in taxes, and that includes the land in PA 490. Next is a statistically valid survey, which can shed light on residents' beliefs and values. It's a great planning tool to help solidify support around a subject, which assists leaders to choose programs to fund. Quantifying our community's support of agriculture and other land uses is invaluable to determining the amount of municipal resources both in staff and funding that should be allocated toward a land use. Studies can also be done to de determine the municipal tax effects of a community adopting one of the optional tax reduction provisions available for farmers. Tax reduction options include an exemption of up to 100,000 on farm buildings, up to 50% of property taxes for certain farm uses, and an additional $100,000 exemption on farm equipment above the 100,000 already mandated by state statute. And lastly, a build-out analysis examines current zoning and existing land use and projects the maximum number of homes and amount of non-residential development permitted under our zoning regulations. It is used to evaluate current zoning, 
to help determine if the build-out matches a community's vision. Obviously, the more developable a community, the greater the potential for change. In general, these studies help coalesce consensus around land preservation, including farmland. So this is my last slide. Years ago, I came to realize that farmers have a unique perspective on land use, that they understand land better than most. I also realized that I have never met a farmer who wants to sell their land for development. Farmers like the rest of us can be in need of money, but they would almost always rather see their property preserved for agriculture than developed, even if they can no longer farm the land themselves. They have spent more time than most of us can imagine working the land. Remember, farming is a business, often a home business, and we should treat farmers with the same respect as we treat our shopkeepers and non-farm residents. Lastly, the older I get, the more I realize that it's damn hard to develop our community's way out of paying property taxes for municipal services. Again, it is the people that cost the town money and not the cows. However, too often communities focus their energy on developing land versus preserving or promoting agriculture. Both have their pluses, but only agriculture provides sustainability in terms of municipal finance, open space, aesthetics, food security, and the environment, which can be appreciated by all. It takes some planning and limited community investment for a municipality to allow agriculture to flourish. And with that, I will hand it back over to Lisa. OK, thanks, Bill. Um, so I just want to, uh, we're going to get started in the second part of this, which is uh, Steve Kleppen, who is the Director of Planning and Zoning for the town of New Canaan. Um, but Steve is also going to be speaking really in, in detail about his role as uh, the chair of the New Milford Farmland and Forest Preservation Committee. Uh, he's been a member since 2006 and chair for the last four years. Um, and also Steve has an interesting sort of three-part resume here because he is also the owner of Windswept Farm, a choose and cut Christmas tree farm based in New Milford. Um, so I think these three perspectives really uh, give Steve uh, a unique perspective to add. So uh, with that, Steve, you are up. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending today. Um, I'm going to try to bring the perspective of if you are a town or a planner charged with establishing a farmland preservation committee or an ag committee in your town. I think that we started that in 2006 and went through a lot of uh, bumps and hurdles along the way, so maybe I can uh, get some insight and help you along the way. If I can get my slides to advance, that would be very helpful. There we go. As I said, we, our committee was started in 2006. Um, and you'll see on this particular slide, there's some very distinct and specific uh, bullet points. And I think the first takeaway is that maybe the second bullet point and the third bullet point were really are only two charges at the beginning. We developed the later bullet points as we went along. I think it's fair to say that at the time we were formed in, in 2006, uh, Mayor Pat Murphy at the time basically kind of said, here guys, uh, see if you can save a farm or two and, and, and see what happens. Um, I, I think we probably exceeded her expectations along the way, but you know, it was a, a tough start at the beginning, but as we got our feet wet, we started learning that there were a lot more things to do in terms of saving farmland than, than just simply saving farms. The committee was set up at the urging of uh, Vivian Harris, who was a longtime advocate on the statewide level for farming. But she uh, you know, went to Pat Murphy and said, we need to do this, and here's why. And then Mayor Murphy was uh, you know, right on board from the, whole, uh, from the whole beginning. One other thing I should point out on this slide, uh, you know, our, our title of our committee is Forest Preservation Along with Farmland. And the state definition of agriculture includes forest preservation in there. And I'll, I'll admit, we didn't really do a lot along those lines uh, for a long time when the committee was started, but we started thinking about that a little bit more and then started thinking about, well, what happens if you had somebody that wanted to have a timber industry, for example, or if you had somebody that wanted to do maple syrup production. So we've, our committee started doing some mapping projects along those lines where we're, we're looking at uh, forest land. So 
what have we accomplished as a committee since we started in 2006? So it's been about 10 years. We've saved a portion of or all of five different farms in town for a total of a little over 400 acres. Now, in some parts of the state, that may not seem like a lot, but up until the you know post-recession, property values in our areas were you know they're not lower Fairfield County high, but they're all they're relatively high compared to other areas in the state. So we, we've been doing pretty good at that. We're actually working right now on our sixth farm, and that one I hope will bring the total, you know, probably over to uh, close to 700 acres. We established the second right to farm ordinance in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we thought that was important. Just, you know, from basically from a standpoint of PR alone and establishing good relations with the local farmers, I, I thought that was something that we've got some definite good press from and fostered some good relationships with the farmers themselves. One thing to do if you're starting out and if you're a planner you have all these tools at your disposal already is that you need to map your farmland and that's a pretty simple thing to do if you have um, GIS capability or perhaps your COG or somebody like that has the GIS uh, capability for you. It's great when you're out in public and you can put the you know a large uh, 24 by 36 map on an easel and you get people looking at the maps just like you would if you're a planner at any one of your public meetings and people are looking at the boards, they're discussing the plans, they're looking at the maps. People like to relate, oh, I was at this farm, I know that farm, it's right by my house. It's a great discussion starter. It, it really adds a lot to what you're trying to propose. We also put together a booklet called Who's Your Farmer? And what that is, is we've tried to total all the farms, you know, and we revise it every year because farms are added and farms are taken off the list and, we, you know, to be honest, we, we probably missed a few along the way, but it's a list of all the farms in Litchfield County as well as some of the surrounding towns of New Milford. And that lists the farms, but it also lists it by the product type. So if that farmer you know, you say you're looking for a specific product, you can index it that way. We've also put that up on our website and our Facebook page. So if you're looking for a farm in the area, if you're looking for, say, you're looking for somebody who sells beef and you want, uh, you know, grass-fed beef, for example, you can search by that tab. That's a great service not only to the public who's looking for these specific items, but it's also a great service for the farmers because it, it's basically it's free advertising and free, you know, getting their name out into the public. Um, picking up on what Phil said uh, during his presentation, we did offer uh, a section in the plan, our plan of conservation and development in 2010, a section on agriculture specifically. And I'll show you a couple uh, pictures from that as we move forward. But I think a couple things that are very significant about that, as Phil said, it's very important to show that agriculture is a viable use and a viable economic use and an important use in the town. But there are some, also some really tangible benefits to doing that as well. For example, if you get to the point where you are uh, proposing an application for uh, purchase of development rights with, with the Department of Agriculture, they go back and they look at, well, what has the town thought about this property before? What, how has the town viewed agriculture before? So you could point to your POCD and say, well, in Section 11, here's the section on agriculture and here are the properties that the town was thinking about at the time. So it adds a lot of weight and a lot of credence to what you're proposing. We've also done things uh, that we work on a scholarship with the Connecticut Community Foundation through one of the farms. I, I mentioned Vivian Harris earlier. We did uh, save a portion of her farm several years ago through the PDR program. And with that family, we've had an ongoing relationship where we're working on a scholarship, an ag scholarship, and we, we I think our goal is to get to $25,000, and we made 18 in the first year, so we're getting pretty close. So that will go to uh, a local student who's looking to pursue a graduate level or a post-high school uh, degree in, in agricultural-related uh, ag agricultural field. We've done, along with the Harris's, and is two successful barn dinners where we've sought donations for auction items, but then got as much local produce, local meat as we could, and then we held two farm dinners, and those were just received really well. Along with that, last year we did our first farm tour, which 
was met with mixed results, but I was told by others who have done farm tours that it takes a little while to get those established. And last year, we're, and we're still working on a farm quilt tour, a barn quilt tour, basically, where barns have these uh, pictures related to the barns on the side of the barns. And what we hope to do long term is to have these kind of mapped maybe on some so if someone just wanted to take a passive tour of the area, they could check out all these farm quilt tours. And it's kind of a good thing to bring tourism to the town you're in, and also as a way for the farms to get visibility and get more recognition. This is one of the maps that we first did. It's a few years old, and we're actually in the process of up updating these maps now. What this map shows is um, municipal farmland. It also shows open space, because one thing, and Ken may touch on this a little later is one of the criteria the state looks at when they're looking for parcels is uh, adjacency to existing farmland as well as adjacency to other protected lands because that, that, that's another one of the grading criteria they look at. So our committee when it was formed and even prior to when the POCD was put together, we looked at a certain area of town which is called the Ridge Road, and so if you're looking at the map, it's on the right-hand side, which would be on the east side of the map, and I'll call it up now. That area is about 1,200 acres of contiguous farmland, and over 60% of that area is considered prime or important agricultural soils, and that map on the right is kind of just a zoom in of that. The green parcels that are surrounding it are existing preserved lands, and so far we've saved, I'd say about 250. 50 to 300 acres in this area, and as I mentioned, we're working on uh, one of the larger farms now. So th I think our goal long term is if we can get this area done, then we will move on to some other other properties in town. And some things that we do for mar farmers, I did mention the Who's Your Farmer brochure. That's something that you know they definitely benefit from because it's free advertising and free free name recognition for them. Um, from speaking from someone who deals on more of the retail end of the farming operation, it, you know things like free advertising are great. Just getting one person to your farm who has a positive experience definitely helps get additional customers down the road because if one person has a great experience, they tell their friends. And that's definitely magnified with things like Facebook because you get one person who reports in from your place saying, oh, we're having a great time they tell six or seven other friends, you get one or two of those to come out, and it just seems to multiply from there. Um, we actually work with local farmers, too, on getting their products to market. We were successful last year in getting one of the local farmers to get produce into uh, Big Y's, a chain of uh, grocery stores. I'm not sure if they're spread throughout the state or not, but they are definitely in, in our area. And they actually took some of our products some of the more regionalized markets also have local products in there as well, and we constantly advocate with those folks to try to get that market share open for them. One thing we do as well is we testify for our farmers at local zoning meetings or tax assessment appeals. Sometimes you'll, I can think of one example where there was a, uh, a development proposed near an existing farm and you know the question came up about how do you protect the new development from the farm and, and our point was well how do we protect the farm from the new, new development because that was our concern and we've also advocated at, as I mentioned at tax assessment appeals where the assessor and maybe was a little overzealous in, in saying well this this property is not really a farm or this building should be assessed differently and then we've come in and assisted the farmers in, in raising some points to you know to counter that. We've also put on several seminars over the last, I'd say, five years. They are a lot of work, and anybody who puts together one of even these webinars can attest to the fact they're a lot of work. The last one we put together was in January, and we co-sponsored that event, and we had over 100 farmers uh, attend that, and it was really well received. Some of the topics that we talked about include uh, taxation issues, legal issues, getting farm labor on the site. Um, one thing that's worked really well and has been received positively is bringing in some of the more successful and diverse farm operations you'll see in the state of Connecticut. I think Kip had a slide earlier where he had some of the Freud farms, and I think Lisa had a picture of the Jones farm down in Shelton. We've had both those groups come up and talk to our farmers, and I can see usually at least once during each talk where at least one of the younger farmers, I, it seems like they can tell something's clicking. 
So I think it's good to give them that idea that, that there's different things you could do, especially you have if you have a large tract of land, maybe somebody's, you know, he can't fully operate that whole piece of property, but maybe if I section off or parson off a, a portion of it, farmer A can, ha can have this kind of operation, maybe farmer B can have a second operation, but there's ways to monetize their property. We're also continually updating our website and um, in our Facebook applications. Those are two really great avenues to get things out, as everybody knows. We, as a committee, as one of our line items in our budget, we have a very small budget from the town, but we do have that budget. The, we have somebody that does our social media coordination for us, and thank God that she doesn't charge us what she probably should be charging us, but we have that available to us, and she's constantly updating uh, Facebook, she's constantly updating uh, the website, and the things that we put on there are, you know, obviously there are committee things, but if, uh, I think at the last slide has our web link, but we also put up uh, events that are upcoming, like our seminars, or maybe there's statewide items of interest, there's legislative issues they're aware of, or that when we get updates from, say, maybe uh, DOAG or somebody else is saying, you know, there's a pest, something you need to be aware of, we try to get that information out to the farmer, so that's another source of uh, information for them. The website also does provide links to all our area farmers, and it gives them, so as I mentioned, similar to the Who's Your Farmer brochure, it also gives them a link to the type of produce, so that if they were looking for, as I mentioned, uh, grass-fed beef, they could click on that and then find out who has that available. There would be the link to that farm, so they could contact them directly to make sure that, you know, they're still doing that service and or find out their hours of operation. We have submitted and worked with several farmers on submitting their uh, PDR applications to the, to the state. That is something that has worked well because you get different levels of sophistication with farmers. You'll get some folks that, um, you know, maybe they're more of a gentleman farmer and they can handle that themselves, or you'll get folks that are completely naive to the process and they look to you for guidance. So it's important to provide that service, you know, so long as you're comfortable with that. Very important to educate your local officials. They, uh, you know, as a couple different speakers have alluded to, they're not always the best informed on these issues or they come to their position as an elected official from a certain perspective and a certain mindset. So we as a committee went out and we actually put together a PowerPoint presentation, which we actually have to start up and do again because we have some turnover on town council and with the mayor's office on who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it's important, and how you can support us. And the beautiful thing is it really got a lot of positive feedback from the, the from those officials and from the farmers as well because they appreciated the fact that we were out advocating to their elected and appointed officials on their behalf. So what does, uh, what does a commission, agricultural commission, need to be successful? Well, these kind of bullet points are all, all really important. You need the right mix of people there and I would say you need the right mix of motivated people. I would qualify that, that saying Everybody who's been a planner or has volunteered on the board knows there are people that just kind of show up at the meeting, haven't looked at any of their notes, and just kind of semi-participate in the process. Avoid those people. Try not to get those people on the board, and if they're on the board, hopefully seek to not have them reappointed when their time is up. This is the kind of committee that if you want to do things, if you want to be active, you can make things happen. Try to keep that group as diverse as possible, I would say recruit a planner. If you're a planner in your town and you're looking to give back or want to serve in some capacity but you're not interested in sitting on the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Planning and Zoning Commission, this is a great way to actually see results and see a benefit. For me, speaking as a planner, when I'm in my town and if I drive by a couple of properties that I know are preserved by efforts that I made, that makes me feel really good. Also, a nice benefit now is that starting in April, there are CM credits available for participating on the local boards. And so this is a one that you can sit on and not have to be in a confrontational mindset or be in that same mindset you were while you're at the office. Some other great skills, if you have people that like to sit and do that, that's a big help. And also try to get some farmers on there as well. 
because you, anyone who's ever talked to a farmer, like a you know, I do. I'm a, like a part-time farmer, but if you talk to somebody who's farming in their family, farming as their livelihood, they have such a unique perspective on things and how things actually function. It's invaluable to have those folks on your um, on your group. What you'll also need is a supportive administration. Now, I have in parentheses there that that should be the easiest part. I have found that to be definitely the easiest part because the beautiful thing about farmland preservation as a concept is there's really no one opposed to it. And even if they are opposed to it, they're not going to be fool enough to admit it in public. People really like farms. It's, it's the easiest thing I've ever had to kind of sell in terms of any kind of application process. No one, no one really um, puts that down. You know, along those same lines, if you ever get to the point where you do submit a PDR application and you need to go back to your municipality for uh, for funding, the, what happens in that process is there's often state and federal money involved. Local officials, and this has been my case as a planner for a while now, if you bring funding to the table, they're much more willing to throw in their support and their dollars into a project when they know there's matching funding. And giving our climate in the state, that's something they'll probably look at even more. You'll definitely need to have some patience because the process of preserving a farm and working that whole process out takes a while. And it probably takes even longer to get that support and that trust from your farmers. Everybody has talk to a New England farmer knows that they're a very suspicious lot by nature. So you have to be patient, you have to understand that, and it takes a while to build a relationship. I have one person on my committee who's been bringing cookies off and on to the same farmer for about five years. And then he's great, he's supportive, and then just as she's about to leave, he says, so what's in this for you? So then we kind of look at him and that's where we leave it off. And his land goes unprotected to this day. As a group, you need to be visible. You need to have people know what you're doing and why. When we first started out, we no one who knew who we were. So what we did at our one of the local fairs and some of the open farm days is we went out and we got over 2,000 signatures from New Milford residents who, you know, were willing to sign a petition said that they supported agriculture. So we, when we later went around and made our presentations to the different boards and civic groups in town, we pointed that out and we actually handed the copies of the petitions into the town council and they were really impressed that this was done. And then subsequently when we went to go do the POCD, all that support was there so that all those folks knew, okay, this group has the backing of the town so it made it much easier to get results later on. I will say, do not be passive. Do not sit back and have somebody say, you can't do this or don't do that. If you push, keep pushing and keep going until someone says no. When we first started out, we had a meeting with another conservation group in town who shall remain nameless, and they kind of laughed at us and said, you're wasting your time. Well, 10 years later, our record speaks for itself, and, and I will say no more about that. And lastly, you definitely need to have good relationships with Cam and his staff. They're all great. They're helpful, accessible, and just a wealth of knowledge, and definitely stay on their good side. And I think this is just shows our website here, and we also have a link on the town's website, but this is our outside website, and I think the URL is available. And if you have any questions, I'll be around at the end. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you so much, Steve. So I think as you see from Steve and Phil's presentation, there is a lot that can be done at the local level um, in terms of supporting agriculture. Uh, so uh, there was the last slide, New, Mil New Milford Farmland Pres org. if you're interested. Uh, and our next speaker is Cam Weimar. He is the Director of Farmland Preservation for the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. Uh, Cam directs the farmland preservation program, uh, including the traditional farmland preservation program, but also the community farm preservation program, as well as the farmland restoration program in Connecticut Farmlink. Uh, he has been an urban planning, excuse me, an urban planning professor, planning consultant, land trust director, and a municipal planner. Uh, that is a lot of roles. Uh, so, without uh, further ado, Cam, you are up. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for a great uh, segue. Uh, I'm going to talk this afternoon about 
uh, the farmland preservation programs available in Connecticut, and uh, how they can work for you at the local level. So there are two programs uh, that we offer, the uh, Department of Agriculture. We have our traditional program, the Farmland Preservation Program, which began in the late 70s. It was the first of its kind in the nation, along with the state of Massachusetts. And we are uh, quickly approaching our 40-year anniversary in, uh, in two years. Uh, about uh, six years ago, uh, we felt the need to uh, have the ability to protect smaller farms that were uh, experiencing considerable development pressure, um, but they weren't necessarily eligible in our traditional program. So the state legislature created the Community Farms Preservation Program. And I will talk about um, what the eligibility would be for uh, a farmer and, and how you uh, as a planner can assist the farmer in the process. And then the federal program is now known as the Agricultural Land Easement Program. And we work in collaboration with our local USDA office in Holland uh, to do joint projects. And of course, we would gladly welcome uh, your involvement uh, with that program. And I'll, I'll talk in a little bit about um, how we move forward with that. So and just in terms of uh, lingo here, our program is known as PDR, the Purchase of Development Rights. Uh, it can be also known as a agricultural conservation easement. And about uh, a year or two ago, the uh, Working Lands Alliance uh, assisted us with a model agricultural conservation easement that land trusts can make use of. Um, obviously, land trusts and towns can work uh, with our program, and uh, PDR and the agricultural conservation easement are uh, interchangeable. Uh, there might be different terms and conditions. When we work with the federal program, uh, we do have to include um, their conditions in an easement as well. So purchase of development rights, just briefly, uh, development rights is uh, essentially the highest and best use, the fee symbol market value, subtracted by an after value, the agricultural value. That equals the development rights value. And um, we uh, actually commission two appraisals for every application that is eligible. Uh, by qualified independent appraisers. So two summers ago, uh, in September, we celebrated our 300th farm that was protected through the, uh, the state program. This was held at the historic Lebanon Town Green. And as of uh, this month, we are now at 326 farms protected. We're at 41,000 acres. And so I'm going to go over, uh, again, our preservation and our farmland access programs that are available for your municipality. You can partner, towns can partner with us with the traditional program. Uh, they can partner with us with the Community Farms Preservation Program. We also would appreciate your support with Connecticut Farm Link, and the website is there on the slide, ctfarmlink.org. This is a clearinghouse for both farm seekers and farmland owners. So towns that may have vacant land that they own but would prefer to see it actively used or not to see any um, nefarious uses, if you will, the teenagers or um, seeing um, junk uh, piled up. A, a, a great way, if you have vacant land that has decent soils, is to uh, enable a, a lease with a local farmer who can um, put it in active hay production or corn. Uh, it will help the town out in terms of less 
maintenance issues. And there are uh, a couple of towns out there uh, that have had great success in terms of leasing their available farmland. And uh, one that comes to mind is the town of Wallingford. And I believe they have presented at conferences about the benefits of leasing their farmland. Uh, a fourth program uh, that we offer is the Farmland Restoration Grant Program. And just last year, the legislature changed the cost share. So 90% is paid for by the state and 10% by the town and the farmer. So uh, again, a great incentive. Uh, you do need a minimum five-year lease term uh, to be eligible for this grant, but it's a great way to take uh, land that you have that has great farmland soils but hasn't been active in a couple of years and restore it and get it back into uh, good shape. Um, other programs, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, because of my time limitations, I'm not going to go in depth, but I do want to mention our Agricultural Viability Grant Program. That is a uh, once a year application. The guidelines will be released this summer. And applications for that program are due in November. That is a cost share. Towns, municipalities, nonprofits are eligible to apply. So please go to our website. Um, and then along with the Farmland Restoration Grant, I have that website listed there, ct.gov backslash doag. So uh, I'll briefly run through our traditional program and how it relates to partnering with uh, municipalities. The PDR program, and I believe um, Phil had mentioned some of these conditions when, when he um, was representing the, the great success in the town of Lebanon. This is in perpetuity. Uh, some states and even some land trusts may do term uh, conservation easements that would only be 15 or 20 years. But for state of Connecticut, once it's protected, it is protected. It, uh, perpetuity. It's, it's, it's still uh, something difficult to fathom. But as Phil uh, mentioned earlier, that cost of community studies, how do you amateurize preservation. Once the town puts in the funds to protect the farm, it's not protected just for 10 years or 100 years. It is protected in that state of land use. So um, that, that is uh, it's, it's pretty ex exciting. Uh, it's for agricultural purposes only. Um, as Phil and Steve uh, have mentioned, uh, we do respect farms as businesses. So agriculture can include farm stands, uh, if, if there needs to be uh, a small parking area um, for customers to pull in, uh, to go into the farm stand, farm store, uh, food processing is included, packaging, that is all included in the state's definition of agriculture and to support uh, a farm as a viable business. Uh, a PDR needs to be managed in accordance with uh, a USDA conservation plan. Uh, they provide best management practices for uh, the farmer. No subdivision or non-agricultural development is allowed. So that would be uh, cell towers, golf courses, um, commercial activity that has no relation to agricultural production. And then there could be uh, restrictions that are specific um, per each farm. Every farm is unique. So the application criteria, this is what our state program looks at. Uh, the USDA federal program is very similar. Um, they have slightly different um, percentages of what they're looking for for a farm property. This one, again, represents the state program. It's the probability of non-agricultural development, the amount of cropland acreage, the acres of prime and statewide important farmland soils. And, and you can determine that by using your GIS that you have in-house and contacting uh, the, the Tolland office and Barb Alexander, who's their GIS uh, director. And she will gladly give you uh, the GIS shape files. They update that every year. Or you can go on uh, the web soil survey and acquire uh, your soils information from there. 
Uh, we also look at the method of the marketing of the commodities produced on the farm. We look at the amount of other active farmland within a two-mile radius. Steve had mentioned that. So a farm in uh, that section of New Milford that he highlighted, if you have other contiguous farms nearby and other protected land, that will increase your score of eligibility for a farm. And then things that we, we would, um, you may get uh, some points off, would be the intensive development near a farm and or the excessive cost of development rights. So that's our traditional program. And uh, shortly, I'll talk about the community farms program where um, if there is intensive development or a high cost, that won't necessarily detract the eligibility if you're in community farms. So uh, I'll go through this briefly. This is our process. Uh, it is a, um, it does take some time, it, and there are many uh, parties involved. And as Steve mentioned, uh, you have to mobilize support at the local level. Obviously, you have to get the support from the landowner because this is a voluntary program. If a private landowner is not interested in an easement, um, you, you don't move forward. It, it is voluntary. So an application would be required from the landowner themselves. Uh, we negotiate a farm configuration where, where they would like to see the easement. Um, we do a preliminary title search in the very beginning to make sure we know who all the owners are. The state will go out and um, commission appraisals, which would determine an offer amount that the, uh, the commissioner uh, would provide to the farmer. If the farmer agrees and signs the agreement, we go to our state property review board for the final state uh, approval of that specific farm. At the same time, we would be seeking the town's support. So if the town um, has a a bond for open space and farmland preservation, uh, we do require that, that there's a, uh, a town vote by however the town's determination, whether that's by a uh, commission vote or by a town vote. Um, we are leveraging our dollars, so we are seeking partnerships not at the, just at the local level, but also with the USDA. And this is the stage where we're looking at the federal review as well. All of our farms have A2 surveys, so we can know and uh, enforce the property boundaries. And of course, right before closing, we would look at the final title. So there, there's this importance, and Kip had mentioned this earlier, of contiguous preserved acres within a community. And this allows the continuity of compatible agricultural use. Um, a farm next to a farm next to a state forest provides adequate buffers. Um, I believe Phil and or Steve mentioned issues when uh, new development comes in. Um, often people are worried, how do we protect the new development from the farm? Well, one strategy of, again, looking at the opposite, how do we protect the farm from the new development is to have clusters of active productive farms. And this is uh, an example of one of the clusters in Lebanon. So our second statewide program for preservation that we can partner with you is the Community Farms Preservation Program. We have 29 towns out of 169 so far. All eight counties are represented with uh, agreements with us. 64 towns have designated locally important farmland soils, and nine, in addition, uh, have applied to the USDA. We currently have 12 active applications. These are farmers who have applied to our program and have a, a local match. They have a town that is willing to partner with us. And we have protected, uh, uh, as of this month, five farms have been protected through this new program. So here's a map about two years ago. The green is the towns that have joint state local agreements with us. The yellow is where the towns have started the process by applying for locally important soils. So that's about two, two and a half years ago. And here we are today. And uh, a lot of this yellow, a lot of the towns starting their process, and you can see Steve's 
town of New Milford is, is in green, so uh, they have a cooperative agreement. Phil's town of Lebanon, and again, 29 other towns have cooperative agreements. And we've had a great outreach effort over the past couple of years. And some of this can be attested to uh, uh, folks who are on this call today and um, through past agricultural viability grants our outreach has really paid uh, dividends to get the word out to the towns uh, about this program. So eligibility for a municipality to partner with us in community farms. It, the, the town must recognize farmland preservation in the town conservation development plan, open space plan, or a separate farmland preservation plan. Uh, the establishment of a town ag commission, and I think Steve definitely highlighted uh, all the benefits of having that ag commission. Uh, conducting an inventory of your town's farmland resources. Establishing a criteria or ranking system to identify the priorities in your town. Which farms, if you had the money and you're able to partner with the state and the federal program, what are your highest priorities? Uh, the designation of a town's Ag Preservation Fund, and again, applying to the USDA for locally important soils designation. So once those are met, once the town has gone through that process, then we can enter a cooperative letter agreement with the town. So this is just to highlight our first community farms program preserved was in the fall of 2014, it was the Kasman Farm. It was actually straddling the town of Columbia and the town of Hebron. And we did a joint partnership with the town of Columbia and the Connecticut Farmland Trust also um, was involved. Here is the map. And again, it straddles the town line between Columbia and Hebron. And it also abuts two protected uh, PDR farms, the Zegda farm in Columbia and the Robinson farm uh, in Hebron. Uh, an, another important note here is um, we spend a lot of energy and a lot of time to get to the closing and to get to the preservation. But we also need to be mindful of the commitment um, of the PDR, that once we have a conservation easement, that we need to do stewardship. And one of the benefits of partnering with the state program is that we uh, have the uh, Attorney General's Office to help if there are, are any, heaven forbid, uh, any violations. And thankfully, in the 38-year history of our program, um, we've only had a few uh, major instances. And again, at that time, we were able to have um, the, the full force of the Attorney General's Office help us uh, enforce the terms of our deeds. So uh, our issues with stewardship, we want to make sure that we're maintaining agricultural use, that the farm is being managed consistent with the conservation plan, that farmers are obtaining approval not only from us, the state, but they also need to uh, obtain approval from the town. And we do emphasize this during our process. So when a farm applies to us and we are uh, negotiating a configuration and they would like to see the ability to build a future house or to build a barn, we emphasize to them not only do you have to get approval from the state program, but you do have to go to your local town. And the towns would have their own uh, zoning requirements and building permit requirements. And our program certainly respects those. Um, so the takeaways for planners here this afternoon uh, please contact the Connecticut USDA office to request locally important soils if you have not done so already. Uh, it's basically an email, uh, a letter from your um, locally elected official to say we would like local designation. The USDA will respond to you, let you know what soils in your town are locally important. Um, your locally elected official will sign off and you are in the system and you will be added uh, to the GIS map. That's going to help your farmers and your community become eligible not only for our program, but for the USDA AL program. It'll, it could boost their score. Contact me 
uh, and KIPP if you know of farmers in your town that are interested in either preservation, farmland restoration, or in transferring their farm uh, if there's not an immediate uh, successor in the family. Again, the Connecticut Farm Link program is there for a resource for your farmers. Uh, and again, we, we're emphasizing the leverage of your local open space and farmland protection funds with the state's uh, fund program and the USDA. We can go a lot farther when we have multiple sources of funding uh, to protect farms all throughout the state. So, um, and again, another benefit of partnering with our program is the stewardship support. Um, we know the ins and outs of the PDR deed, and we also have the um, additional legal protections through, through the Attorney General's office. And finally, uh, I just want to commend all of you for your interest in uh, preserving agriculture in your town and preserving um, uh, that way of life. And you are our essential local ambassadors for farmland pre preservation. So I do want to thank you because I can't always be out to all the corners of the state. And by letting the farmers know that our program is out there, you, you do an invaluable service for us. So thank you very much. OK, great. Well, thank you so much, Cam. And uh, so there's Cam's contact information. Uh, and our next speaker, we're running a little bit behind. I apologize for that. But our next speaker is uh, Joan Nichols. Joan is the Director of Member Relations and Community Outreach for Connecticut Farm Bureau Association. Um, if you know Joan, you know she's uh, just an amazing resource. Uh, she provides a ton of one-on-one -on -one assistance to their former members on many issues uh, related to running an agricultural business, uh, including taxation and land use, transportation, labor laws, marketing, um, and many other, uh, many other areas of expertise that she has. So with that, Joan, please take it away. OK, well, thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you, everyone, for participating in this afternoon's uh, webinar. Um, again, I'll, I'll uh, reiterate what Cam and my the previous presenters have said, is that um, the, the planners and the work that is done on the local level in Connecticut is, is just as important as the work that's done on the state level to support agriculture. Without your cooperation, um, it's just, it just doesn't happen. So, um, uh, we appreciate you uh, participating this afternoon to kind of learn the tools that you can utilize and bring back to your community. So with that, um, I'm going to give a little, little bit of a different spin to this presentation. And um, for those of you that are not familiar with Connecticut Farm Bureau, we're a private nonprofit. We've been around for 96 years in the state of Connecticut. So we have a lot of institutional knowledge in how agriculture works in the state of Connecticut. And we work directly for farmers. Um, we are solely supported by the dues that our farmers pay to Connecticut Farm Bureau. So I work for farmers. So my presentation is going to be a little bit more on how do you engage farmers in the planning process. And um, just a little aside, um, farmers by and large tend to be um, a very private group of people. And um, when we start talking about creating ag-friendly regulations or ag creating an ag commission, there tends to be a little bit of um, apprehension on the part of the farmers because they hear words like commissions and they automatically associate that term with other commissions in their town which have a regulatory role, your wetlands commission, your planning and zoning commission. Um, so um, thanks to the good work of the Advocate Program in Eastern Connecticut and uh, the good work of other folks in other parts of the state, like what Steve is doing out in New Milford, agricultural commissions are becoming more and more accepted and, and actually welcomed in communities. And um, farmers are beginning to understand the role they play. But I'll, I'll tell you, earlier on when they were first introduced, um, farmers actually thought that they were commissions that were going to be put in place to regulate them. So it's sort of an interesting spin. The other thing is um, 
creating ag-friendly zoning regulations can be a little bit of a challenge, and we certainly understand that. Agriculture is fluid, it's diverse, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and that therein is lies the challenge. So what I'd like to do is just give you a few tips on how to engage the farmers in the planning process. The first thing that I would suggest doing is that if you're going to go down the road of pre, you know, revising your zoning regulations to be more ag friendly, or say for instance your zoning regulations have some pretty good um, context related to agriculture, but say you don't have a section on agritourism, or you don't, or you have a section on vineyards, but you don't have the um, sort of the, the the added value eventing that sometimes goes along with with vineyards and other farms that want to do agritourism. Whatever you're looking to do to amend your zoning regulations, the very first thing that I would suggest doing is engaging the very people that are you're looking to help or, or regulate or whatever term you want to use. So it's often valuable very early in the process to do some sort of an informal, what I would call a round table. So, and, and literally a round table in the sense of um, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to have an informal uh, discussion about what we can do to help agriculture in our communities. Some of our farmers have come to us and wanted to do A, B, C, or D, which currently is prohibited in our zoning regulations. Or we've had some issues arise with new farms coming into our community. Um, it's so challenges for our neighbors and those of us in the planning and regulatory um, roles. So what can we do to make this work? And sometimes just having an, uh, an informal meeting, you invite the farmers, you invite the non-farming community, you invite um, municipal leaders, even your assessor's office, et cetera, and you know, have the, the cookies and donuts and hot coffee, and literally set the room up in more of a round table format as opposed to many of us that are used to going to town hall and we're there because it's a public hearing. And so the, the commission sits up on one side of the room, and it's set up theater style, and you're facing your audience on the opposite side of the room. And as soon as the farmers go into that environment, it automatically feels like a town meeting or a public hearing. And just, just that makeup is not always conducive to open conversation, but if you set the room up as little round tables or something like that, that, that tends to work really well. So first of all, just earlier on, just have some very informal discussion about what you're looking to accomplish. Also recognize, and this has been mentioned earlier on in, in many points, is that when you're, when you're looking to work with farms and, and regulate farms or write zoning regulations for farms, you know, we all love the bucolic nature of our farms, but you're regulating a business. There's going to be traffic. There's they, Many farms now want to do on-farm retail. Um, they, there could be noise. I mean, you're creating, you're, you're helping a, a farm, you're helping a business. And that oftentimes is the challenges with zoning because our farms are not obviously in the commercial or in the industrial area where you expect traffic and noise and, and they're in out in the country. They're often in residential areas and oftentimes that interface is really the challenge that, that planners face. So um, get farmers involved early on. By all means, um, I'm going to see if I might get my slide to advance here. It's not advancing. Why isn't it advancing? Um, so um, why is my slide not advancing? <laughs> Um, let's see. So the, um, the other thing that you want to do is um, make sure that you reach out to folks that, like, that are on this webinar, Connecticut Farm Bureau, Connecticut Farmland Trust, um, the Department of Agriculture, other planners um, that have worked with the farmers in their community. And when you're going down this road, um, you know, find out, you know, what they've done in their communities, you know, sometimes, play, you know, towns often want to just talk to other towns, but also engage those service providers out there 
to um, to engage you, so and help you out with the process. Um, uh, I don't know why my slides are not advancing. Um, Joan, if you're hitting return, that's not working. If they're not advancing, I don't know why. I'm hitting enter, and they're not advancing. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why my slides are not advancing. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So we're going to do it this way because my slides are not. Okay. So some of the things that we see are ad regulations, what we call regulations of concern. And this has been reiterated before by previous presenters. So certainly um, we have some state statutes. Um, that support agriculture. We have the right, our uh, right to farm law. The right to farm law in the state of Connecticut has been in place since 1981. The right to farm law um, is directly re is, is in response to what we call the five nuisances related to agriculture: smell, odor, dust, um, noise, mild forms of water pollution. And the right to farm laws in your town, whether you create a right to farm ordinance or not, but we'll talk about right to farm ordinances. Um, also with the right to farm law, anything related to those um, nuisances, that authority comes through um, jurisdiction over that is with the Department of Agriculture. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, certainly everybody has spoken about the definition of agriculture. If you're looking in your zoning regulations, you want to adopt the entire definition of agriculture. Um, when you decide to define agriculture and then you start to pick and choose what you want to allow or not allow in your community, that gets to be a little bit of a challenge. And I'll give an example. For some reason, um, our four poor little friends, the pigs, um, municipalities continue to not want to allow um, uh, piggeries or hog operations in their town. I think that hails back to the old days of when uh, pig farms were, were not as, as you know, well maintained or as desirable as they are now. And we're looking for fresh beef and fresh poultry. We're also looking for fresh pork. And public health codes dictate that the pigsty has to be at least 300 feet from any resident. So public health codes already give you a 300 foot uh, setback from any resident. So I'm not really sure why we're prohibiting figures in our zoning regulations. We have Public Act 490, which is um, our current use assessment law. So when you start to nitpick away at what you allow or don't allow for agriculture, you could run into conflict with our current use assessment law, which looks to allow for all forms of agriculture. Um, and then we also have permitted use of right language in our Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Act. Um, so those are the, some of the statutes that you want to be um, cognizant of. Some of the things that concern us on the local level is when we start to set minimum acreages for farms. If you look at the statistics that KIPP provided, obviously our farms are getting smaller. We're seeing more and more farms looking to take advantage of what we call indoor agriculture where uh, they're extending the growing season, they're looking at hydroponics, where you're doing very intense vertical, sometimes, agriculture in an indoor environment. And um, you don't need a lot of acreage to do that. You can do a pretty intense indoor agriculture operation, hydroponic, on very limited amount of acreage, one acre, two acre, three acres. So be aware of minimum acreages for farms. Fence, fencing, setbacks for fencing, that's a real bone of contention. Uh, you know, they always say fences make good neighbors. Um, when we're looking at fencing setbacks for livestock or wildlife barriers for deer fencing, um, we do not want to take um, land out of production agriculture. So when you're doing setbacks for fencing, you're, um, you're actually looking at uh, reducing the amount of acreage that can be in production agriculture. You're creating a maintenance problem for the farmer because the land that's no longer being farmed, that little strip of the 35 or 40 foot setback that you want off the property line, sometimes becomes a maintenance problem because now it's a place for invasives to come in. 
in all kinds of problems. And the biggest problem we see is that when we have a setback for fencing, the setback and where the fencing is located now actually becomes the unintended boundary line. And years down the road, we're, we're incurring survey costs and litigation because now there's a dispute over, over where the actual boundary line is. So be cognizant of, of fencing setbacks. We don't want to be regulating livestock husbandry, how our animals are kept, how they're housed. That falls in the hands of our farmers. And also, uh, we have uh, uh, really good experts at UConn Cooperative Extension educators who are there to assist with animal husbandry concerns, as well as the Department of Agriculture. So also, the whole animal density issue really try to avoid you know the numbers of animals per acre it's really how the animals are kept and site suitability you can have um, you can have a lot of acreage you know but if three quarters of it is poorly drained or excessively poorly drained soils then it doesn't matter how many acreages you have if the soils or the slope of the topography is not suitable and um, also you want to avoid a costly and time consuming um, regulatory process. That doesn't work for the farmer. Um, oftentimes farms need to diversify. They're, um, they're working with the growing season. If they're applying for grants, there's certain deadlines they have to get work done. And so you start getting them um, you know, involved in a lengthy and time-consuming permitting process. It just causes a backlog for the farm. It could be a, a financial hardship to them. And it really doesn't accomplish everything it's supposed to be accomplishing. Um, next slide, what we consider ag-friendly regulations. And again, this has been mentioned before. Compatible with state statute, provide some flexibility for the regulation and permitting process. Consider site suitability. Consider farm parcels and different ownerships. Sometimes uh, you have one owner on one parcel, but you have numerous farm owners and other parcels, but it's all part of one farm. Uh, consider lease agreements. Um, so somebody that has is leasing a budding farmland, that may constitute the minimum acreage they'll need. Um, On-farm marketing, we all know that this is Connecticut, it's southern New England, and direct consumer marketing is the key to our farmers' success, especially for the small farmers. That means that they need to oftentimes do on-farm retail, whether it's a CSA, whether it's a farm stand, whether it's seasonal or permanent. So think about creating a flexible environment for on-farm marketing. Phil had mentioned um, you know, subdivision regulations that have some sort of uh, buffer where the um, onus is on the subdivision and not the farmer to, to maintain and keep that buffer. Um, and last, uh, tools to support local agriculture. Certainly, uh, agricultural commissions are fantastic. Um, I would also encourage you to think about um, thinking about, on the regional level, creating an agricultural council. The Lower Connecticut River Cog Council of Governments a few years ago adopted a regional agricultural council of the Lower Connecticut River Valley. And now there are 17 or 19 towns that are represented on an agricultural council. We have enabling legislation that allows that to happen. And that, that regional approach and that sharing of ideas can really be nice. And certainly the adoption of a local right to farm ordinance. I'll just do a caveat. When we hear that it took eight or nine months to develop a local right to farm ordinance, that's already a red flag for us. Your right to farm ordinance should have a very simple mission statement, and then literally you cut and paste the state statute in there. If you start um, giving authority to your local commissions or planners on right to farm issues, you're usurping the authority of the Commissioner of Agriculture, and that could be problematic. So uh, your right to farm ordinance is great. But what you're really doing is creating a policy statement. Whether you create a right to farm ordinance or not, the right to farm law is in every municipality in the state of Connecticut under authority of the Commission of Agriculture. But the policy statement is, is, is a good one. And then um, let's see. I'm going to get to our next slide. Um, oops, and I think I just lost my slide. 
um, do, 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 I apologize for this. And I think last but not least, um, here we go. And that's my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, so I realize we're over time, but we just have a few more uh, slides to finish with. Uh, Kip Polsinski is coming back to uh, talk about tools and assistance to bolster agriculture and communities. Uh, so if Kip is ready. Sure. Uh, yep. Great. Right. So, so again, I thought there were a couple of good points that were made, and we'll just a couple of things I want to highlight here is that it's very frustrating for me when I read in the Hartford Current about some a town that's uh, debating a regulation or an issue about agriculture and agricultural operation, and no one has reached out to any of us. You're not alone. There is help out there. Do we have all of the, you know, staff and assistance and infrastructure that we that we need in the state as relates to agriculture? No. And though there are some really smart talented people. So definitely, first place is to call, you have a question, Department of Agriculture, the uh, Cooperative Extension System with UConn, the Ag Experiment Station, um, Connecticut Farm Bureau. Those are places to call. If they don't know, they can find out who does know. And the uh, we have USDA, uh, which uh, Cam talked about, is USDA there's three sister agencies. Natural Resources Conservation Service is the technical agency. They maintain the best management practice standards across the country as relates to a lot of agricultural practices. So between Department of Ag, UConn, and RCF, they'll know of what the, the current best practices are. Farm Service Agency is, a, is, is essential for local farmers to know who they are. They have disaster assistance. Uh, insurance, they have micro real loans and loan programs for, for purchasing land, for, for uh, uh, loans to keep in production, and rural development is a, is a really good partner for both urban and rural communities. They have grant programs. Uh, if you're an urban community, they actually actually have grant programs that can help with, with businesses that are involved with food hubs, but uh, town sewer, water, fire, energy projects, so they have assistance pro programs for individuals as well as for municipalities. A lot of NRCS's programs are specifically for farmers. The exception being is that you could, as a municipality, partner directly with them on a farmland protection process. Unlike what Cam was talking about with State of Connecticut, a farmer can't go in to an NRCS office and say, I want to protect my farm. Um, they have to work through a partner like a town or a land trust or the state of Connecticut. So, and then again, there's a host of other organizations here. A lot of this is going to be outlined in the planning for ag documents. All of these contacts. And there's some really good supporting evidence initiative. When you need to make the case uh, for plan, you're updating your plan of conservation development and making the case for a, uh, an ag committee and uh, funds in a farmland preservation program. A couple ones that I would point out is the Governor's Council of Ag Development Reports. There's some really interesting stuff in there about agriculture and what it needs and uh, where it's going. The other thing is the New England Food Vision is really cool. It's if New, if New England, if we wanted to grow 50% of our food, what would that take? And what would Connecticut share be? So that's, a, I think, a really interesting document. Again, a lot of stuff going on with farm to school, farm to chef. Uh, the 10% campaign, again, we should all be signing up for that, keeping track of and promoting Connecticut grown and produced foods. So those are some really good information that's uh, out there to help build your case for the things that you'd like to do to support agriculture and keep agriculture growing. And I appreciate your ideas and commitment to keep agriculture growing in the state. And it's National Dairy Month, so go out and eat ice cream, buy Connecticut-grown strawberries, ask for Connecticut products for all of your functions. Lisa, take it away. Great. Thank you, Kit. Um, Kim, if you can just advance the slide to the contact information for our presenters. Um, I'd just like to thank oh, yeah. all of them. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry about that. Um, 
So there's the contact information for all the presenters. Yep. And so please feel free to get in touch with any of them if you have direct uh, questions. Um, and now um, we wanted to try something. Uh, if people have questions, there's a little hand icon that will allow you to sort of raise your hand. Um, if you want to open it up. Um, and we will be able to unmute your line. Um, so if there are people with questions, if you want to try that, um, we can do that. So I will give you a second to do that if you have questions. Um, Phil, there was a question from uh, Rob Phillips about the importance of cluster subdivision. So I don't know if Rob is still on, if he wants to try to raise his hand and ask that. Rob, are you still on? OK, so I will um, ask the question for Phil. Um, but he said um, he had a question about the right, uh, the importance of, uh, or that you had mentioned the importance of cluster subdivision. And he said it has to be done right, as a true cluster-only design can create other problems with cutting up large chunks of potential open space uh, or farmland preservation. Um, and he said um, you had mentioned two-acre yield, but allowing quarter-acre lots. And he said, how do you dictate specific lot layouts and obtain usable, appropriate preservation areas. So Phil, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that part of your presentation and answer that question. Sure. Uh, I thought I responded in text uh, to everyone to answer that question. Um, so the first thing you, you have to do is, is mandate cluster, but more as importantly, you have to 50% open space set aside because without the 50% open space set aside you have no leverage with a developer uh, once you dictate that you know lots can be reduced to a, to whatever size septic or sewer can can handle and that it's not the size of the lot that counts but it's the 50% open space set aside that matters where the Commission has discretion that's when you can negotiate back and forth that also requires a requirement that a developer provide context-specific site maps about prime and important farmland soils, viewscapes, conservation features, mature, mature healthy trees, things like that, and then come up with an agreeable plan between the commission uh, staff and uh, the developer. But until you mandate that that uh, mandatory cluster with the 50% um, set aside and towns like Granby have been doing it for decades um, you really can't uh, uh, you can't you can't get the kind of development you might want okay, great um, so if there are no other questions uh, we will um, someone asked about getting a copy of the uh, the presentation of the webinar and we will certainly do that so when it is uploaded uh, I will also be sending you a, uh, a short evaluation that I will hope you will fill out and get back. Um, and then uh, we will be sending you the copy of our Planning for Agriculture Guide, a hard copy for you as a reference, uh, a tool to, uh, to refer to. So um, if there's nothing further, uh, I think we will wrap it up. And again, I thank you for attending and for your attention. And certainly, uh, if you have any questions, please do feel free to get in touch with uh, any of us.